happy October. Welcome to uh, Deschutes Public Library's online programming. Today's program, um, The Mystery of Aztec Hieroglyphs, is part of our series in October called No Mystery, where we are exploring together all things mysterious. Uh, the majority of our programs are recorded and available for viewing on our YouTube channel, and we encourage you to explore all the great content uh, that we are making available virtually. So I would like to introduce Dr. Stephanie Wood. She is the director of the Wired Humanities Project at University of Oregon. She earned both her PhD and MA at UCLA, and she's been doing programs uh, at the library for years. So <laughs> welcome back to uh, library programming in this virtual format. Format. Thank you so much, and hello, everyone. I am delighted to tell you about one of my newest projects, which is still ongoing. And I'm going to share my screen with you, if you just bear with me for a moment. Get my slides up there. OK, I hope everyone can see that. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Aztec hieroglyphs um, are a fairly recent topic of study. Um, and yet you probably have heard of hieroglyphs, more likely you've heard of Egyptian hieroglyphs. Perhaps you've heard of Maya hieroglyphs uh, in this hemisphere in Central America. Um, and, and so Aztec hieroglyphs fit into this broader study of imagery used as a kind of writing. Uh, prior to that, we had imagery used as a, a kind of communication. We you know, all around the world, you'll find what people call rock art, which includes pictographs and petroglyphs like you see on the screen right now. Um, and these are painted or carved, and that's the distinction between those two terms. Um, but they're not syllabic and they're not phonetic as far as we know. We, these go back so far, we have very little to go on to fully understand them. Um, there's a lot of guesswork involved. They're thousands of years old. So, um, but I believe they're the precursors to what we're gonna look at today. Um, we also have something <clears throat> uh, called winter counts, for instance, uh, here in this hemisphere up in what, what's now the, the Dakotas. And uh, this is a sort of history of what happened in this year and what happened in that year that runs from 1790 to 1910, this particular one. <clears throat> and it's a wonderful history of events um, that was probably, you know, that was made by someone uh, who is Lakota and, and probably, uh, you know, represents that specific language, except that visually what we don't see, at least as of yet in deciphering these, we don't see syllables and phonetics. So that makes it still a story written in pictographs versus a story written in hieroglyphs. And we'll get more as we go along, you'll get a better understanding of the distinction there of you know, what is a hieroglyphic type of writing system. <clears throat> there were early writing systems in three parts of the world, Mesopotamia, China, and Mesoamerica. And um, some, you know, they go back at least hundreds of years in, um, in the Americas and thousands of years in the other two places. But here in Mesoamerica, one of the interesting things is how many different writing systems emerged. Um, in Mesoamerica is basically Mexico and Central America, big part of Central America. Um, and you can see there the dates, they have, you know, were kind of, there's a list there going from early writing systems to the last ones leading up to European contact. Um, so Aztec writing falls into that late category, but it seems to descend from uh, one of the classic period writing systems from Teotihuacan. And if any of you have been to Mexico City and taken a trip to the pyramids, you probably went to Teotihuacan, which was uh, an amazing classic period city, one of the biggest cities in the world. And then the Aztec capital um, is now buried under contemporary Mexico City, but we'll take, we'll take a look at that. Um, who were the Aztecs? Here's a map showing the Aztec empire. Um, the lighter pockets in the middle of it are, are areas that uh, in part were not conquered. And um, the, I think that there's a couple pockets even too small to show up here, but the Aztec empire uh, reached down into Central America, especially to the region on the coast, the Pacific coast there, um, El Salvador today where cacao was grown. And so chocolate was a motivator for in, imperial expansion. So the Aztecs were a central Mexican imperial power um, who conquered neighboring communities and 
you know, sort of built this empire based on the extraction of goods and laborers from other regions, but let them be semi-independent as long as they accepted um, the extraction of goods and labor um, from the emperor. So um, here are some images renderings by artists of what Mexico City, uh, the capital of the Aztec Empire, looked like prior to contact. Really uh, fun to see how artists imagine it. We don't really know for sure. We do know the location of the biggest temples. We know that there were canals running through the city. Um, there are a lot of foundational arch uh, archaeological remains, but uh, and also some paintings from contact period ish <laughs> that tell us how big the temples were and what they looked like oh, somewhat. So getting to the glyphs, that big city, that amazing civilization, the huge empire uh, had this um, complicated form of graphic expression, which was in, involved multiple uh, media. So carvings on stone, paintings on pottery and on our walls and what we call murals, and then paintings on paper. So they had paper, it was made from the bark of a ficus tree, so kind of fig bark paper. Um, they painted often that paper oh, with a kind of a smooth whitewash and then would paint on top of that. And at the bottom there of that one example, of uh, what we call a codex, which is an early book, early form of book writing, um, there are alphabetic um, phrases. And those were added to explain what the native painter had created there. Uh, so in, in Aztec, uh, alphabetic Aztec, language writing, Nahuatl, and in Spanish, you find these explanations in writing. We'll come back to that. Those are very important and very helpful. <clears throat> so some of the mysteries of decipherment, I just wanted to jump right in and see if you, know, you could guess what we're seeing here in terms of uh, what this glyph might mean. So there's a glyph there, and then there are three dots, and below that, a man with a bag on his back and a what's called a tump line over his forehead to hold the back, and he, he kind of leans forward and carries the weight. Uh, around his waist is um, a loincloth. Now, <clears throat> you know, I can tell you a hint here that this was a laborer who was carrying goods to be extracted by the imperial powers from some community. Um, now, above the person, that's the glyph is the top piece and then three dots. So wondering what you might imagine that would mean. Um, <clears throat> I know we can't really have a conversation here, but I'm hoping you'll think that the three dots may have some kind of numerical value, and they do. And the, uh, the feather, which appears above it, also has a numerical value. And then how do these two values interact? Are they added together? Are they subtracted? Are they multiplied? You know, this is something you have to figure out. <clears throat> and sometimes guesswork comes into it, uh, in fact. And over time, looking at lots of manuscripts, codices, studying lots of glyphs, you get clues and you figure it out eventually. But this particular manuscript is called the Codex Kingsborough. And unfortunately, we had some alphabetic writing added by someone to explain what we were seeing. And so I just took this um, central example from the page. And if you know Spanish, los mil y doscientos tamemes um, y los principales uh, is what that particular, what we call gloss, little short text. That's what it says in Spanish. And what it means in English is 1200 men to carry loads. So looking back at the notation, the glyph and the number, um, we can see three, um, and when you think about three in relationship to 1,200, perhaps it will dawn on you that maybe this was three times 400, which gets you to 12, 1,200. And that's in fact what it is. The feather was the glyph for the number 400. To the left of that, you have three dots again and a flag, and the flag was the number for 20. So three times 20, we had 60 uh, carriers uh, with pine nuts. So I, we could go on and decipher this whole manuscript eventually, but you have to learn uh, what, the, what the numerical glyphs were, which is not hard, we now know that. So those short texts that we call glosses are like a Rosetta Stone for us with the Aztec hieroglyphs. Uh, and the Rosetta Stone, you might've heard of that. There's their language programs called Rosetta Stone, but they stem from this stone that had the same text written in three different languages. And um, that has 
you know, was discovered and then deciphered in the early 19th century dates from, you know, before the common era, almost 200 years before the common era. And at the top are the um, Egyptian hieroglyphs. And that was what finally helped people figure out the Egyptian hieroglyphs. So our short alphabetic texts uh, written, you know, after the fact, added to the codices to explain what we're seeing visually um, have become kind of our Rosetta Stone. So this is the homepage of the project we're building of uh, a database of Aztec hieroglyphs, images of each glyph, and the glosses, the te short texts with translations in English and Spanish, plus scholars' analyses. And sometimes the scholars disagree on their interpretations of a glyph. So we have multiple um, representations of how the scholars are seeing a given glyph in some cases. Our current focus, we're starting with the Codex Mendoza, this more than 70 page manuscript written about 1541, painted and written, and um, you know, extracting the glyphs from every page. And we have over a thousand now, we're uh, gradually adding all our analysis to each one. It's a painstaking process, but we're hoping that it will help people when they discover a new manuscript Script, figure out what those glyphs mean by looking through our catalog online for free. Um, so you can see on the, the detail I've given you there, we have um, calendrical symbols and numbers on the left hand bar that's vertical. At the center, we have a cactus on top of a stone, which was the glyph for Tenochtitlan, the capital city. And, um, there's an eagle sitting on that cactus, which is now a symbol on the Mexican flag. And then we have below that a symbol for war, about a group of arrows and a war shield. Um, next to each person portrayed on this page, there's a name glyph. So we have place glyphs, we have name glyphs, we have calendrics, we have ideograms that stand for logograms. In other words, that war symbol is you know, more of an idea than anything that you read specifically uh, in the word for war. Uh, here are a couple more pages just to show you. Each page is just loaded with material that we're extracting for our database. And to look up close at a couple of place names that appear in the Codex Mendoza, um, what idea uh, might be represented in these two examples of place names? Well, you know, again, it's anyone's guess until you until you look really closely and study closely. The top one uh, is an animal that has an antler. The antler is painted turquoise, probably for a reason. We don't know totally why yet. Um, antlers typically are not turquoise in color. These, this is a deer, masat means deer. And so that's a deer antler. Uh, below that, we have a sharp pointy thing. You know, what might that be? Well, it's a thorn. Um, and it's red and turquoise. Turquoise really refers to things of great value. Uh, and the red, in this case, I believe, is a hint to the blood. These thorns were used for bloodletting on the human body. Uh, so people would poke themselves with the blood to uh, it, poke themselves with the thorn to draw their blood. So um, those kinds of things are explored in the database interpretations, but um, just wanted to share with you the words behind these images are deer and place, thorns and place. Now, they show teeth and they use teeth to get people to say tlan, uh, because tlantli means teeth. And so place means tlan, those two words sound a lot alike. So they use the teeth to draw out from people the reading tlan. So it's deer and place. So it's partly an ideogram of the deer um, and, a, and a phonetic logogram. So we've got a complicated thing going on here, which is sort of syllabic. And that makes writing different from pictographs and petroglyphs. Here's another example where we have flowers, those really beautiful yellow, red, turquoise, and green um, elements. Uh, and those two flowers are sitting on a rectangular field. That's an agricultural field. Um, and then you have a, a buttocks and some legs over on the left-hand end. Um, and the reading of this is really about the flowers, Sochi, and meal from Mili, agricultural field. And Cinco means at the little Xochimilco, at the little flower fields. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with buttocks in meaning. That's a phonetic syllable. So again, 
the phonetic combined with the ideographic uh, and you get a writing system. And it's really beautiful. This manuscript has wonderful color um, and painstaking detail. Look at those flowers, just incredible detail where you see the stamen and the pestle or uh, you know all the different component parts of the heart of a flower. So I wanted to also share that a writing system typically has syntax complexities. So we have nouns, adjectives, verbs, adverbs. Um, sometimes you'll get um, articles like the, uh, that kind of thing, but mostly it's um, a combination of nouns, adjectives, verbs, and adverbs. And so here are some examples. Uh, I love the, uh, the necklace, the jade necklace, which is found in many burials in the archeological sites. Still today, you find the beads. A lot of times the red leather um, necklace, the thong that they were strung on has um, deteriorated, but the jade beads are still findable. Really, really beautiful. Okay, another an example of a mystery. When you first look at this glyph, what you see are flames, which relate to the verb, it burns, tla tla, and you have a disc of gold, uh, which is teokwitlat. Now, Teokwitlat literally means divine excrement. So it was believed that gold nuggets were like um, the excrement, the poop of the gods. So holy shit. Oh, sorry. I probably shouldn't swear. Uh, but anyway, that's the kind of thing that they were indicating with that circle. But also the elements inside the circle have a quadripartite, a four-part division, which is partly relating to the, the way they viewed the cosmos and the cardinal directions and so on. So gold um, being very divine and connecting to the cosmos. And here it's burning. Um, but in fact, what's really uh, happening with the tlatla, the verb part, is that it's telling you, again, to say the name, uh, the word for place at the end of Teokwitlat. So you have, you've got Teokwitlatlan, uh, which means place, and Tlata elicits that phonetic sound. So um, that's why the verb is there. And so it's a visual that, it, you know, if you don't know the language, you might not know what it's saying. Um, and that's very specifically tied to Nahuatl, the Aztec language. And I mean, other people could look at it and go, a burning gold disc. Well, that's that's not really what it means here. Were there sentences? Um, a lot of people uh, appreciate the complexity that sentences represent, and we do have some uh, in the um, Aztec hieroglyphic system. And so this is one I especially liked. Uh, it was deciphered by a colleague, Gordon Whitaker in Germany. Um, and it starts from the bottom and works its way up. So it's basically telling us that in Tenochtitlan, there's that Cactus on a stone again that represents the name of the capital city. Um, a fire was drilled, and you see a, a piece of wood with little hole, black holes where uh, someone has taken a stick and rub it between their hands, uh, putting the point on the plank and, until smoke and fire would emerge. Now, I think some of you may know about how Boy Scouts do this, but this is an ancient Aztec practice, and fire drilling was was taking place typically um, every 52 years. It's like a their century, if you will, a 52 year cycle in the calendar. Um, it was a very special moment uh, signifying great events. And, and, uh, and in this case, it was the inauguration of the great temple in, in the heart of Mexico City, Teno, Mexico Tenochtitlan, you had this double temple, which was um, their primary devotional center. Um, so it was inaugurated in the year, and that's the upper left corner there is read and, and four and four or a total of eight um, numerical indicators. So eight read was the calendar year that translates to, to our calendar in 1487. So this is way before, before Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, right? So this is pre-contact, a memory of an important event that was recorded in history by the Aztecs. Okay, here's another kind of mystery. Um, I promised that I would show you some of the genius, what I think is genius of Aztec hieroglyphs. Um, and this is one that kind of tickled me when we finally figured it out. Um, and this is uh, obviously at the top of plant. Uh, the big bell-shaped green part is a mountain. Um, the little swirly parts on the edge of the mountain, those are rocky outcroppings. And then at the heart of the mountain, there's this leg foot thing. Um, 
And so, you know, one looks at this and wonders, you know, what is this, some kind of leg plant, plant leg, you know, foot, what's going on? Well, here's a decipherment for you. <laughs> uh, we have the little gloss that said, this is Xocoyotepec, so the, that's the name of the town. This is a glyph for a town. Um, and the main feature of this word, Xocoyotepec, the Xocoyoli part is that plant you see at the top. So I put some photos of the plant. I think they did a pretty good job of capturing the shape of those leaves. And the stems have a reddishness to them and they've painted the stems red. So there you go, the artist is taking, it's painstaking a representation of the, of the plant. Now the rest of it is a phonetic compliment. It's telling us, if you don't know what plant that is, if you don't recognize it, let's give you some hints. So we've got bells there, which are coyoli, and we put a foot and um, that's sho. So shokoyoli, uh, the plant is reiterated um, visually to get you to have the right reading, the right phonetic sound in the Nahuatl language. So again, very tied to the specific language. The other thing though, is that this shares with us an example of a dancer's attire, uh, at least as far as the lower leg, what dancers wore. They wore bells, they wore jaguar pelt skins around their um, calves. They have sandals on with red thong, leather thong ties and so on. So kind of fun that one, I think. A uh, couple, three more examples of kind of interesting compounds that can be deceptive. So here we have on the left, a coyote uh, and a hole in its body. And we have a tree and a drum. And then on the right, we have a pond with a mirror in the middle. So uh, trying to figure out like, well, what's the word that, what are the words that are, they're trying to elicit with these images? You know, we could easily be confused if we don't know Nahuatl, if, we, if we're coming from some other Central American, culture or Mexican culture and we and we aren't and we don't know Nahuatl, we could really be confused. So here are the here are the terms in Nahuatl that we're getting. By the way, coyote, <clears throat> some people say coyote. Coyote's actually closer to the original Nahuatl, which was coyote. Um, so that's the the animal, is the coyote. And um, that's just so that you know that that's not just some dog, like a chichi or a sholot. Those are other words for dogs. They put the hole there so that you would know this is a coyote. This is a coyotli hole. The word for hole sounds a lot like coyote. So you've got uh, the phonetic indicator there, this kind of homophones. The two words that sound a lot alike um, are to help you with the right reading, to get the right reading there. Uh, the same with the one in the middle, you have the awewet cypress tree, um, and then you have the wewet drum. So this is not just any tree. They want you to know they put the drum there to say, because oh, you would recognize right away that's a wewet drum. That there were two main drums. Teponosli was a horizontal log with a with slits cut in it, and then there was the standing drum. So everyone would know this was a wewet, and then they would look at that tree and go, oh, that must be the awewet cypress tree. Um, so that's another uh, kind of fascinating combination. Um, and then we have um, a tescat for pond and tescat for mirror. So again, these homophone uh, words that help you get the right reading. Um, and in this one, I think that in, in the, the two on the right, really, there's a semantic uh, redundancy as well. Um, because a pond, like in Bend, you have a mirror pond, right? A lot of ponds can be mirror-like. So that, that's a kind of semantic redundancy. And then the tree of the, um, the awewet, which in Spanish is called awewete today, uh, that tree is, has this massive wide wooden trunk. So that wide drum also kind of gives you a big clue that this is, um, and they've made it wide there. Sometimes they're narrower, those drums. They've made it wide here and it's a brown wooden color. Um, and you, um, might, it might help you think of that tree. The first time I saw that tree, I nearly cried. It was just incredible to me um, how wide it was and massive. And there on the right is, is one, an example of an awewete drum today. Here's another mystery. So this is going back to the hill. You've already seen hill, the glyph for hill, tepet. Um, and um, I've been just looking, looking at those red and white, red and yellow horizontal stripes and trying to guess what those are. The curly cues, as I said, on the side of the mountain are rock 
outcroppings. But you know, what's this bit at the bottom? Why would a mountain have red and yellow at the bottom? Okay, so looking around through other glyphs for those kinds of red and yellow stripes, um, I'm giving you some examples here of what we found that might help provide insight into the red and yellow on the mountain glyph. So we've got the umbilical cord or navel or belly button glyph, which has a red ring around it and a kind of a yellow center. Interestingly enough, you've got that green from mountain and those rocky outcroppings around the edge of the umbilical cord um, symbol too. So there's sort of a, a connection between human internal, human interiors and earthly ones. The same with the cave to the right of that. It has a, a mouth. So a cave is seen as kind of a mouth entering the underworld, entering the earth, earthly underworld. And it has that same mountainous out, uh, rocky outcroppings uh, on the back of its head. Um, and you, you enter the cave through this mouth and the mouth has the red and yellow lining. So interiors, both human, monsterly and, <laughs> and earthly. Uh, also we have uh, organs from inside the body tend to be red and yellow. So interiors again. And one other, couple other hints here. Um, we have the word for shoulder often shows actually the bone protruding from the top of the arm, which draws your attention basically to the shoulder. They give you the whole arm so you know the context of the shoulder, uh, but the bone protruding and in this case water emerging is kind of interesting because that part has the red and yellow lines. And then the water ditch also, this really looks like a construction here and, and canals were constructed, but they also had natural water dishes ditches and, and and that would seen as kind of the interior of the earth as well water running along um, a ditch in the earth so human and earthly interiors again may relate may give us clues to these red and yellow lines on the mountain and final clue and this is the one that really excited me was water emerging from that spot on the mountain um, and mountain springs were incredibly important because a lot of settlements we're on mountains for defensive purposes and the, the spring, mountain springs provide water for life uh, sustenance. And so uh, mountains were hugely important and so were mountain springs. So I'm thinking that's what that red and yellow horizontal line, you know, connects to water, uh, wet and uh, interiors. Um, so we go along looking at glyphs and trying to connect them to their cultural and historical meaning as we did with say the drum um, and the tree and so on. Uh, and if we look at this painting of the main temples in Mexico City uh, in pre-contact times, but this was made after contact, um, we can see some features of the architecture that uh, still resonate with us in what survives today in Mexico in terms of architecture. So uh, you can see one of the temples has a red and turquoise um, crenellation, if you will, or rampart, we call it at the top. And the butterfly, butterfly palace in Teotihuacan on the right there still preserves that original type of architecture, even the circles. Um, and that's kind of exciting. Uh, the circles were representative of power, um, rulership, but also they seem to have a water connection because again, water was so precious and that may explain why we have the turquoise color there. Then the black and white circles also, same circles just painted a different color here, but again, tied in with, <coughs> excuse me, the rulerly palace. Uh, and we have one that still survives today in Oaxaca. That's the only one I know of, but it's um, the pre-contact type of palace, ruling palace, uh, which our glyph Tecpan um, captures some of that dimension. Okay. Um, so we, in the, creating our database, are atomizing compound glyphs. In other words, taking apart all the elements and adding them to the database, as well as the full compound. We provide the compound and we provide all of its elements, each one identified in Nahuatl with Spanish and English translations. And the reason for this is it helps us to compare and contrast, track change over time, maybe identify which artist painted which codex. Um, and so here's an example of how we've databased this ritual bib or vestment that was worn over the chest and was sometimes made with eagle feathers, as we see in the top left, 
or heron, white heron feathers were also very highly prized. Um, and then paper and cloth. Uh, the vestments were also made from various these various types of material. Um, and so we have, I think all of a sudden, just with these four examples, a much better sense of what the word kemet means, what it looked like, how it could be varied. Um, another in interesting mystery that arose, well, in 2016, there was a, a scholarly article about emotion among the Aztecs. And then it kind of gradually over time hit the, um, the sort of the tabloids almost. It hit the headlines of a lot of newspapers. Gosh, did the Aztecs feel emotion, which to me is a stupid question, but you know, actually emotion studies has become very popular, but to just even imagine a people didn't have emotion, any people didn't, experience emotion to me is really crazy. And it kind of captures the stereotypes that we have about Aztecs, that they were just bloodthirsty animals or something, um, which of course, if you start studying the glyphs, you see that they were um, artists, they were musicians, they were philosoph philosophers, they were very philosophical. Anyway, yes, of course they had emotion, but um, I actually had someone even write to me and say, do you have any glyphs that show emotion? So here's some examples. Um, it, there aren't, they aren't super numerous, but I think we're just getting started. So I think we'll find more, but left there we have you, Kawali, which is usually translated either widow or abandoned woman. Uh, center top, we have pleasure, joy, or Awilisli is also translated as recreation. So it's obviously someone, someone having a good time in the water. <laughs> um, and then on the right, a quarrel. Um, and uh, I mean, a quarrel would suggest a lot of emotion, you know, anger anyway. Um, and I just wanted to share a little bit more about the details. The one on the left, she has tears coming down from her eye. And we know that's water because I provided you the water glyph. The water glyph has these uh, turquoise in color with lines of currents and then splashing off the water are little water droplets and shells. So again, those water droplets we saw on the palaces um, as a possible reading of those circles. Uh, the coral, I just threw in a cartoon fight symbol that I found on the internet because that's what it reminds me of, this black swirling dark dust. Uh, I believe mean, that's an interpretation. I'm not quite sure really what, what's, what's being portrayed here, but it's pretty strong uh, suggestion. Um, Another emotion glyph is the liver, uh, which you wouldn't necessarily think of has to do with emotion, but it did in Nahuatl. Eli was, uh, and Eli in various forms, the E-L being attached to other words, often had to do with strong, sometimes negative emotions. Um, but it made me think, you know, it's not so weird to think of the liver in connection with emotion, because in our culture, uh, or, you know, Western European US culture, you, we have expressions like I have a gut feeling or it turns my stomach or so-and-so is a chicken liver, a scaredy cat, um, or I'm feeling liverish, melancholy. So yes, we have um, language and terms and concepts that are culturally relative, but we also have human universals. And that's where I think our understanding of emotions should really go there at least explore the possibility of human universals in emotion. Okay, our objective when creating this database is partly to um, aid with the teaching of Mexican culture and history and the language. Um, and one of the ways we want to uh, hope to do that is by helping children learn to type with glyphs. So we're creating a kind of a, what we call a Unicode set, which is a bunch of symbols like emojis, if you will, kids loved you know, typing emojis into some of their texts. Um, and now someone has created already an Egyptian hieroglyphic Unicode set. And someone else is, another team um, is creating one in Maya glyphs. And so we're creating one in Aztec glyphs. So what we do is we take the original painting and turn it into a, a scalable vector graphic, which you see on the right, which can be magnified uh, and it doesn't pixelate. You can do lots of things with it. So that's what that's the, the trend right now in creating Unicode you know, typing sets. Um, another objective we have is to create a decipherment tool. As I mentioned, when people discover a new manuscript, they want to um, figure out the glyphs if they don't have texts, glosses explaining what they are. Um, they could go to our 
they could upload an image to our database and then it would be compared against other images and helpfully show them something that might help them understand what they're seeing in their glyph. And this draws from, I don't know, face recognition software, which is now called visual recognition because so many things are being studied this way. These are early results. We had a Google grant this past summer where a scholar in India and a scholar in Spain were working to help us <clears throat> create this visual recognition where we would get maximize the number of examples that were drawn up that were actually pretty good, pretty close to the original. And I think they've done a marvelous job. <clears throat> we qu haven't quite made it activated on our site yet, but we're working on that behind the scenes. Um, finally, we have um, advanced searching for uh, helping people decipher. So if you pretend I have a glyph from a newly discovered manuscript and it's rectangular and it's yellow, I can go to the advanced search and enter that shape and enter that color and say, what do you have that's yellow and rectangular? And maybe you'll find, you know, you'll be able to tell me what my glyph is. And so, you know, here's what would come up in this particular case, um, which was the glyph for a place called Amakostitlan, which has that yellow uh, and some water and the teeth, which is the tlan part, as you already know now. Another decipherment tool that we are providing are links to our online Aztec language dictionary, the Nahuatl dictionary. So if you have a gloss that says Tepoztlan, you can look up Tepos and find that it means copper or metal, and then the Tlan part means by, it's a place indicator. And um, that's all I have to show you right now. So um, we can go to questions. Where do people, where are these manuscripts, where are people finding them? Yeah, well, they mostly are located in national archives. Most of them are in, say, in Mexico City in the National Archive, but also all over the world because travelers in 19th century Mexico were buying them up. People were selling them because they couldn't read them anymore. They didn't remember how to read glyphs. And so, you know, a community, say a traveler in a small town would say, oh, what, what a magnificent manuscript. You know, why don't you sell it to me? I'll give you 80 pesos. And then they would take it home and then it would end up in a, you know, in an archive in Germany or somewhere in Paris or London. I mean, they're all over the world. A lot of them are in the United States in libraries and archives. And, but the fact that they're still being discovered is because a lot of these little out of the way towns have archives that no one ever happened to get to or look at. And um, like, for instance, in the state of Oaxaca, um, somebody found a, an old trunk in the back of a church and they opened the trunk and it had this old sheet music from the 17th century. And on one of the pages was part of a codex. And so, you know, there was a big scramble, a very great excitement. Whenever code, new codices are discovered, it's really um, a thrill. And then, but then you have to sit down and the scholars have to work on figuring out what they say, yeah. uh, it's really yeah. terrific. <laughs> so that, this is an interesting question that's come in from um, a participant um, and sh they want to know, can, I'm going to, I'm not going to say this right. Nah, N-A-H-U-A-T-L, we no. 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 speakers no. today read these glyphs or has the language changed? Um, let's say they had, like I said, by the 19th century, they had pretty much, even in the late 18th century, they'd forgotten most people, a very few people could still read them, but, um, it became mostly an oral instead of a written language, um, with Mexican independence in 1821, um, the, the new government said, we're not going to have, you know, um, anything written in indigenous languages anymore. It's gonna be Spanish only, kind of like in our, our country, we have this English only uh, push from some people, you know, that other languages just confuse us. We don't need other languages, just one language. So that really contributed to the decline of writing in Nahuatl. It stopped being written in about the 1820s. Um, and yet today, because a lot of uh, Nahuatl scholars are in the universities and starting to study their language and their history, and these, including these manuscripts, some of my best collaborators are Nahuas, native speakers of Nahuatl today kind of rediscovering their heritage and reviving it. And so um, I think once we're able to type with 
Nahuatl glyphs. That'll be kind of fun, but you can already write it with the Roman alphabet because when the friars arrived in the 16th century to Mexico, one of the first things they did was create schools and take the scribes who'd made the codices and have them learn to write with the Roman alphabet. But they, they encouraged them for 300 years to write in their own language. So we have hundreds of manuscripts that are alphabetic knowledge. And we have, <clears throat> through most of the 16th century, they kept painting and writing with glyphs. Um, so we have maybe not quite a hundred codices, um, but then lots and lots of documents that were just written in alphabetic knowledge. So, there's a, a rich repository. Well, there are repositories all over the world, but we're creating digital collections of these things so that we can all study them and collaborate in, in their interpretation. Yeah, this this is this leads into the next question from Paul. Paul says, Hi Stephanie, has your work been used yet in teaching school children in Mexico? Um <clears throat> yeah, a little bit like um. Mexico City passed a law saying that Nahuatl had to be taught again in the schools. Uh, the problem is that the cost of all the teaching materials and training teachers to teach it uh, was kind of formidable. The law was passed before really there was there were all the things needed to do it. But by creating these resources and putting them online, teachers are able to tap into them for free. And yeah, they're getting used. Um, I've also found like um, one of my graduate students and I went to the Oregon State Penitentiary where there's a Latino club. And we were invited there to give a lesson in um, in, As in the Aztec language and show them something about glyphs. and. Um, and we had a blast. I mean, I've never had a more enthused audience. I mean, it's, I think, you know, people are there probably kind of bored, hungry for something to read, something to learn. And, um, but it was also this heritage thing. A lot of kid, a lot of these people in the audience said, hey, I grew up in Mexico, you know, then I migrated here and, you know, they didn't gotten into some trouble and ended up in prison. But they said, you know, in school in Mexico, we were taught nothing about our heritage, our indigenous heritage, you know, but that is catching on now. It's just that it, it took a long time for that to happen. Anyway, I'm really promoting uh, the use of these materials. Um, I, I have held uh, five summer institutes for school teachers and we they're creating curriculum and that's all free online too. So some of the curriculum involves the language and, uh, and some of it is just other things like Aztec religion or what have you. So, but it is getting out there somewhat slowly. Uh, awesome. So Albert wants to know, um, can you give us examples of words in English that have roots or come from Nahuatl? Absolutely. I bet a lot of you know Nahuatl, uh, at least know some words you might not even know it because they come into English from Spanish. So if I said aguacamole, I wonder how many people would recognize that. Probably a lot. A lot of you, if you, if you live in the West, it's in almost every restaurant that has any kind of Mexican food. Um, and the word, the aguacamole, mole is sauce. So if you've been to Oaxaca and you've had mole, that's from the word mole, which means sauce. Mole, so mole often has like chocolate and spices in it, and it's uh, and chilies. It's it's not sweet. It's not usually very sweet. It's more. It's yummy, like, is what it is. Oh, so good. <laughs> um, and the word awaka on the awaka mole comes from awakat, which is what they said for avocado. So our word avocado comes from that. Um, you have our word for taco comes from placo in in Nahuatl, which was. Uh, either half or folded in half or doubled. And when you think of a tortilla folded in half with something inside, that's a taco. So um, that's, the, our, I mean, there's so many words, chocolate, chocolate. Um, we have chitomat, <clears throat> chitomate in Spanish, tomato in English, um, and I could go on and on. But there are, yeah, I always, um, I often, when I go to with school children, I start with, how much Nahuatl do you know? And everybody goes, oh, I don't know any, you know? And then it turns out there's this whole long list of words that they really do know. So it's kind of fun. Um, so I'll give people a couple more minutes if they have questions, but I have another one. So mm -hmm. when you're talking about, I, I was wondering who did the glyphs, but then you answered that scribes did them. I, I'm wondering what role the scribes played in the community. Yeah, it was a hugely prestigious role because, um, because very few people knew how to paint the glyphs. Um, and so it was usually, you know, there's usually one scribe attached to every ruling palace. Um, and, you know, they weren't the, the rulers, but they were highly educated, important people. Um, and then 
that contributed to the fact that almost every pueblito, every little town in Mexico had a scribe who learned the, to write the same language with the alphabet. And so while the number of people who knew glyph writing was limited, uh, the minute the, the colony appeared, the Spanish colony, um, there was great encouragement by the friars for every town to have a scribe who could use, could write Nahuatl with the Roman alphabet. So that's why we have thousands of manuscripts still today that are in the archives from those, from pretty much say 1540 to 1820, uh, long, long time of writing, writing, writing like crazy. And, um, and the scribes continue to be primarily male. Uh, we do have a few examples of females. Um, I wish there were more, but that's just not the way it was. It was not the woman's role for the most part in that culture. Yeah. Okay, well, I don't see any other questions coming in. This okay. is interesting and really beautiful. I mean, the, the glyphs are beautiful and they, they did start to make sense, especially when you <laughs> that, that coyote slide. I was like, that, that's, that was my moment where I'm like, I know what she's talking about now. All right. <laughs> so, yeah. It's amazingly um, complicated, but and yet if you just spend a little time, you can start to get it. It's uh, yeah. really fun for me. It's like if you like word puzzles, if you like, you know, the New York Times spelling bee or you like the Sudoku or whatever, you're going to love trying to decipher hieroglyphs. <laughs> yeah. Well, and this online resource that you're working on is just so exciting. So um, good luck as you pursue this work. Thank you. And thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. It was a great pleasure for me. Thank you. Well, good seeing you.